as everyone joins, um, I'd like to um, we'll wait one or two seconds as people start to join us. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Sarah Martin. I'm the uh, Community of Practice moderator for the GBV AOR, and we're very thrilled today to welcome you to this webinar on older women and gender-based violence in emergencies, hiding in plain view. This is a topic that's been very near and dear to my heart since um, I almost got a consultancy with HelpAge in Myanmar to go and look at the uh, what was happening with women in Myanmar. And um, I've always uh, really admired their work. So it's a great honor for us to uh, have the Help Age crew here with us today. And also two other women I uh, deeply uh, admire, Lee Ashley Lipscomb and Danielle Roth, both who've also worked on this topic a lot. And you'll get the chance to, to hear from them later on. Um, so let me just uh, tell you, if you're new to the community of practice, um, we are a product of the GBV area of responsibility. We have over a thousand uh, gender-based violence specialists working in humanitarian emergencies around the world. If you're not a member and this appeals to you and you're interested, you can always write to us at gbvcop at gmail.com and we can send you the application uh, materials. Um, another product of the GBV AOR that we wanted to point out is the help desk. Um, the help desk is available for you to provide up to three days of technical support to you on any inquiry that you might have on technical advice or support. So please feel free to write to them at the bottom at enquiries at gbvie.helpdesk.org.uk. So you can find all this information on the GBV AOR website as well. So. Um, so what are we going to be doing today? We have a lot of information that we're packing into this uh, webinar, so I'm going to be brief. But um, after this welcome, um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lee Ashley Lipscomb, who is going to introduce the topic and um, tell you a few things about it. And then Marion Staunton from Help Age International will tell you a bit more about their work. Then we'll pass it over to our colleagues working in the field who will give you a, a deeper understanding of how to actually how people are actually responding. Um, so we're going to look at um, Help Age Moldova's work with Ukrainian refugees, and then we're going to go to Manepo, an uh, NGO that's working in Malawi, that's looking at a very different context with older women there. And then finally, we'll bring it back down to some um, case management tools, which is really important to us all, with Danielle Roth from International Rescue Committee. Um, please feel free to write any questions you have in the chat, and we will uh, keep track and we, if time permitting, we have to reveal. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lee Ashley. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I'm delighted to be here today. I do care a lot about this topic, and it's such an honor to be with you all. So I know we're tight on time, so I'm just going to dive straight in um, and really start uh, the conversation by thinking about uh, the types of violence um, that affect older women, not just as older women in their older years, but um, the lifetime of violence that they have experienced. So older women, uh, when they're older women, face domestic violence, economic abuse, spousal abuse, um, and within that psychological abuse, sexual violence, including rape and sexual harassment. And on the slide, you may notice uh, that there are some very specific types of, of violence that particularly face uh, older women. Sorry, Lee, Ashley, you were accidentally uh, muted. Could you unmute yourself? Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, I'll go back just a moment. So uh, on the slide, you may notice there are some specific types of violence that are particular to older women, and they can include um, things like violence against older women uh, within family settings, as well as within institutional settings, 
exploitation of older women labor, um, as well as uh, physical abuse um, by caretakers or health providers um, and deprivation of health care, as well as uh, restrictions on freedom of movement and even forms of femicide, such as suicide packs or mercy killings. But why I chose this slide is because I think it very effectively um, visualizes it's not just about uh, the forms of violence, particular, particularly experienced in older age, but about a lifetime and those cumulative effects of violence. So GBV against older women is both a form of elder abuse as well as a form of violence against women. So it really sits at the intersection of age discrimination and gender discrimination. Now, all of the risk factors um, for experiencing the types of violence in this spiral um, are exacerbated for older women in an emergency. And older women are often exposed to multiple emergencies in their lifetime. So one woman may experience uh, GBV in a conflict setting and then experience in another uh, round of conflict later on, as well as uh, with natural disasters and also the traumatic effects of witnessing violence or uh, traumatic effects of being exposed to, to crises multiple times um, do impact on the effects of gender-based violence. So to recap, older women are affected in two key ways by gender-based violence, especially in emergencies. First, in a number of emergency settings, there are older women who are survivors of gender-based violence that they experienced in other life stages um, and who still suffer from those effects and they need services and support. And second, there are older women in emergency settings that are targeted during the emergency by perpetrators and become victims of GBV um, specifically because they are older women. And I will share this graphic uh, later in the chat box. Next, I'd like to move to the barriers on the next slide, please. And let's really talk about the access to services. So while these effects of GBV over a lifetime are negatively impacting on an older woman's well-being, they frequently are experiencing a decrease in access to services. So particular barriers are isolation and inadequate social support, uh, in particular um, as older women may become more dependent on caregivers which also impacts on their ability to uh, seek and also obtain private confidential uh, services, as well as on their ability to make autonomous decisions um, uh, on informed and informed choices about the services they wish to access. As an older woman, there are also physical barriers that come with uh, decreased mobility or hearing or seeing impairments. Um, cognitive decline, all of those impact on the physical accessibility as well as their uh, ability to access information about services and even the information to uh, make informed consent uh, choices. Then there are some particular barriers I'd like to highlight about being an older woman and accessing sexual and reproductive health services because often those services, particularly in humanitarian settings, are framed around the age group of 15 years to 49 years. And if you're older than 49, you may not have the same access to the care providers who are trained or who are most accessible to know how to provide um, gender-based violence um, services. Um, and also there are particular stigmas for older women um, people may not believe uh, that they could be targeted for such things as sexual violence or that indeed they're sexual, sexually active or need to access um, sexual uh, health services at all. And finally, on this slide, I'd just like to highlight their specific definitional and representation barriers 
because women fall uh, into um, an age category as well as a gender category, it's not always clear who researches, who provides services, um, and they may not fit in any of those frameworks. So that's why often this issue is talked about as being invisible. In good news, in June uh, this year, uh, the UN human rights expert on older persons has specifically called for us to decrease uh, these barriers in research so we can make GBV against older persons more visible in our data systems and research. Next slide, please. Uh, I just want to briefly highlight this note that came from the whole of Syria GBV AOR response. They have looked at all these barriers I just presented and really contextualized them for the whole of Syria emergency. And they've also developed a very effective checklist. Um, you'll see the key areas of that checklist there to ensure that when we design our gender-based violence programming and emergencies, we're um, collecting disaggregated data so we know who's accessing our services, who's not accessing our services. Um, and we're also developing awareness and capacity of service providers and communities on the specific needs of older women. And we ensure the representation of older women from a governance perspective when we plan and design GBV services, as well as engaging with older women as we uh, design, implement, monitor, and evaluate our services. So I will put the link in the chat box to this. Um, and I really hope you take a look and think about how you could contextualize similarly in your context. Next slide, please. I wanted to just quickly highlight the area that I work in, which is conflict-related sexual violence. Um, I work on it more generally, but I wanted to raise it here because I've really been uh, amazed in the over 20 years I've been working on this, how often older women have not been believed that they could experience conflict-related sexual violence, when in fact, they are often particularly exposed as those who are left behind in a conflict setting. Um, and part of that stigma and disbelief does have to do with the difficulty they have in accessing um, health services and emergency settings. Um, and also uh, research has shown over many years that the traumatic effects of conflict related sexual violence last for decades. Studies with World War II survivors have shown in their 80s and 90s, there's still very real health effects um, for survivors. Um, and that is actually transferred generationally and creates new uh, vulnerabilities. So conflict-related sexual violence can happen to older women, and also older women are still feeling the effects of conflict-related sexual violence um, in humanitarian settings um, that are contemporary now. So just to give you a sense, um, in our current emergencies, uh, we have uh, verified reports of conflict-related sexual violence against older women in Ukraine, South Sudan, Ethiopia, Mali, Myanmar, Sudan, DRC, Syria, as well as Haiti. So that just gives you a sense of actually how uh, pervasive the risk of this form of GBV is. So let me close though on a more positive note. Um, first of all, that uh, I strongly believe that there should be no age limit on experiencing uh, GBV in terms of uh, our belief um, and that older women can uh, also experience all forms of GBV, including sexual violence. And of course, there should be no age limit on them receiving the quality of care for GBV at any point in one's lifetime. And similarly, there should be no age limit on a woman's access to services to embark on a healing journey um, and to uh, really foster their own uh, meaning for justice. So with that, let me hand back to you, Sarah.
Thanks so much, Lee Ashley. So great as always. Um, my internet's a little bit unstable, so I won't speak long, but I'm going to pass it straight over to Marion. Marion, please feel free. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. And thank you very much to our previous speaker. Uh, some of that, uh, some of the, what you've highlighted, I will also be touching on. So my name is Marion Staunton. I am the Global Humanitarian Protection and Mental Health Psychosocial Advisor at HelpAge. And I would like to just uh, share with you some information before I hand over to our partners that we work with in Moldova and in Malawi. So the next slide, please, Sarah. So HelpAge, in summary, it coordinates a global network of organizations whose focus is to promote the rights of older people to lead dignified, healthy and secure lives. We have over 170 members across 90 countries throughout the world. Next slide. Now, what is important for us to keep in mind is that the world, in the world, we're living longer. So just a couple of facts here. Population, the percentage that will be over 50 years of age in, in fragile countries where we tend to have conflicts and disasters, that looks like it's going to increase from 12% in 2020 to 19% in 2050. Globally, 46% of older people, that is people over the age of 60, have a disability. And that is a, an issue and a factor when we're looking at uh, GBV, violence, abuse and neglect and elder abuse. Also, 4% of all people displaced uh, within a humanitarian crisis are older people. So this is a reality that we have to deal with as humanitarian workers. Next slide. Now we have a lot of different terminology. I won't go into it in detail as uh, the presentations will be shared, but we do look at violence, abuse and neglect. This is a common umbrella term that we use in HealthAge International and others use to describe different forms of violence experienced by older people for many different reasons, but not limited to their age, gender, disability, where they're from, marital status, class or sexual orientation, and so on. Another term that we do uh, talk about is elder abuse. And you may be aware that World, World Elder Ab Awareness Abuse Day occurs on the 14th of June. And this is looking at many different, you know, singular repeated acts or, or even lack of appropriate action when it's incurring in the dynamics of a trusted relationship. So financial, physical, psychological, sexual, in, indeed neglect, exploitation and abandonment. Uh, next slide, please. So, all forms of elder abuse, including GBV and sexual exploitation and abuse are generally underreported and are often hidden, largely because they do take place, if we're thinking of within the humanitarian context, within a family setting, by a care or caregiver, or maybe another person that the older person depends on. Um, older persons themselves uh, tend not to always report as they fear retaliation or stigma, or sometimes they don't know and may not even recognize what they're going through as abuse. Now, something that was mentioned by the previous speaker that we really feel is very important is that in many humanitarian contexts, uh, older people are often overlooked in, in relation to needs assessment where good data that disaggregated by sex, age, and disability is not collected. So we don't really know the, we don't even really know the, the dynamics and the diversity of the older people, but we also don't know the extent or fully understand perhaps the violence, abuse, and neglect that they may be enduring. We do know from the research that has been done is that those that are higher risk are older people, older women, older women with disabilities, and those with support needs. 
So the next slide, please. Older women are frequently subject to one or more forms of abuse, violence, abuse and neglect based on their age, gender and other characteristics. Um, and it was mentioned by our previous speaker that uh, older people in many situations in the world have gone through a number of humanitarian crises. So an older woman who may have been displaced multiple times has increased risk. Now, much of this is driven by ageism, sexism, and those different characteristics of the older person that comes into place. Uh, in one recent study, and I'll have the um, reference for this in the notes, over 15% of women reporting to health services for support for sexual violence were over the age of 55. And we know that more recently with our COVID pandemic, prior to that, it was estimated that one in six older people were subject to abuse. However, with the COVID pandemic, this really exacerbated circumstances that put older adults, adults at a higher risk for abuse, neglect and exploitation. And that is the same with humanitarian situations. They exacerbate circumstances and increase the risks for older people with the dis disruption of service, the disruption of access to services and basic needs and support. And also, as I've mentioned, needs assessments, not collecting information on older people. So the next slide, please. Now, some very basic important steps that we and that I would stress when we're trying to ensure an inclusive GBV support services for older people and indeed to understand the situation is to start including questions on disabilities, disability, and I'm referring here to the very simple six Washington group questions to include those in your assessments along with age cohorts. I've seen and I continue to see from different sources, you know, where age cohort, age cohorts are not there. And when it comes to older people, it's 60 plus and that's it. But I think it's really important to bring in the age cohorts into assessments and service mapping. Also to look at integrating age, disability and older adults into GBV awareness raising and referral mechanisms strengthen referral mechanisms for older GBV survivors and to promote or, or promote or improve inclusive GBV services. So how can you do that? Again, there's three basic steps. Collect better data. So that's your sex, age, disability, disaggregated data, recognizing the diversity of older people, understanding and addressing barriers. Barriers can be attitudinal, institutional, or environmental, and include the participation of older people in all of this to get their understanding, get their input on this uh, particular issue. So the next slide. So thank you for your time. I'm going to hand back to you, Sarah, and I think you're going to uh, include now colleagues from Moldova and Malawi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marian. And indeed, yes, I am. Um, I am now going to, we're going to hear from two examples in the field of how HelpAge and their partner Manepo are um, operating. First, we'll learn um, about uh, the Ukraine refugee response in Moldova with Tatiana um, Sorokan. And then we will hear from Andrew Kavala from Manepo about um, how they're working uh, to the cyclone response in Malawi. So Tatiana, with no further ado. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Marian, for this introduction into the terminology of uh, GBV and uh, VEN, as we call it at HealthPage International. Um, I am going to speak today uh, about our GBV work in humanitarian settings, but just to say that uh, at HealthPage International uh, branch office in Moldova, we have experience on tackling violence and abuse since 2012, when we first started the project uh, the first project on uh, GBV. Um, uh, the next slide, please. Um, beginning with the humanitarian emergency in 2022 uh, uh, that is related to Ukraine, uh, we had this uh, uh, wonderful possibility to engage uh, uh, in support of uh, the Ukrainian refugees as a result of the uh, Ukraine war. Uh, you can also see on the slide some information uh, and some statistics about the war in Ukraine, uh, and uh, it has been uh, uh, termed by many specialists already as the fastest growing refugee emergency since uh, World War II. Uh, you can see uh, a number of uh, casualties uh, and deaths uh, of, of the war and also uh, in Moldova at the moment, we have 90 uh, plus uh, K uh, refugees, uh, and uh, of these, about 15% are older people. Um, older people, refugees uh, traveling to Moldova, a uh, majority of them are women. Um, actually, not only older refugees uh, are women uh, in its majority, but uh, overall. Uh, just because this is the context, uh, the men stay behind and women travel uh, to other safer spaces. Uh, as for GBV uh, in Moldova and our experience uh, in this area, uh, we have learned and uh, have uh, different sources of information and ourselves conducted a research on uh, uh, elder abuse in 2015. So the statistics says that about 33% of women of different ages experience uh, uh, different types of abuse. Uh, as for help age data, 28.6% uh, uh, of cases of abuse uh, were among uh, older people. The next slide, please. Um, uh, it should be mentioned that uh, 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 with the start of the emergency uh, with the Ukraine war, uh, the government of Moldova was really proactive and uh, it allowed us as well as a civil society organization to engage with the government and the UN to respond to this emergency. And uh, uh, we received a UNFPA funded project uh, uh, where we uh, uh, aimed to build resilience and protection uh, uh, and cover protection needs uh, of uh, all the uh, women survivors of violence or uh, all the women at risk of violence. So uh, we looked into prevention activities of GBV uh, and also uh, um, kind of eliminating or, uh, the risks of GB GBV for all the women that were placed in uh, refugee accommodation centers uh, in Moldova across different communities. The next slide, please. Uh, as you can see uh, from the slide, and as was mentioned in the previous presentations, uh, the types of vulnerabilities of all the women in the the crisis or Ukraine crisis uh, are loneliness, loneliness uh, and insecurity uh, as a result of uh, uh, refugees leaving their home country. Um, and of course, uh, a lack of uh, uh, basic resources for leaving uh, and uh, um, post-war trauma. Uh, the trauma that can lead to mental health issues and protection issues. Uh, also, uh, other vulnerabilities are risks uh, to domestic violence uh, and uh, lack of digital skills. And I was happy to hear uh, that being mentioned in the first presentation, because one of the areas that we uh, worked on is actually improving li uh, digital literacy of all the people. And of course, lack of social participation activities uh, that we also try to tackle through this project. The next slide, please. So in the framework of the UNFPA project, we built safe spaces and you can see in the picture how they look. 
uh, this is an enabling environment for all the people to come, all the women to come into the rooms and uh, uh, for different sessions, either psychological or legal consultations or uh, just communication with their peers, uh, with different other uh, people that are around uh, from local community uh, with the specialists. So we built five safe spaces and uh, uh, 45 local staff were involved in supporting uh, uh, the refugees. And uh, um, there were five local coordinators, uh, 10 uh, social assistants, uh, 30 young volunteers that helped to train all the people to use uh, their uh, mobile phones. The so next slide, please. Here you can see um, the um, activities, the capacity building activities that were held to enable uh, the volunteers to provide trainings to all the people on how to use the mobile phones. And actually 50 smartphones were donated as part of this project and 30 volunteers, 20 Moldovan volunteers and 10 Ukrainian volunteers were trained to support uh, trainings to all the people on how to use internet and how to uh, uh, use internet meaningfully, how to apply for services, how to learn information relevant to the refugees. Uh, and uh, all the people uh, having these digital skills could confidentially uh, contact uh, uh, service providers of their own needs uh, because they were uh, kind of uh, uh, confidentially confidentially can, uh, can can speak to the uh, service providers and not uh, being uh, offered some services as uh, in the whole community of the uh, safe space. Uh, the next slide, please. So uh, other types of uh, activities uh, that were offered to uh, refugees staying in the uh, safe spaces were community visits uh, also made by local volunteers. These visits were made for social care, uh, then uh, information, increasing awareness about uh, GBV and increasing awareness about actually the support services within the uh, uh, safe spaces. Uh, the flyers were distributed, different information material was distributed, and the uh, people in the communities, the uh, 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 refugees were informed about available services and uh, the, uh, that these services were ab available 24 by 7 and uh, uh, refugees could call or receive support uh, for, for the uh, counseling of different types. Um, so information, separate information sessions were also held for the refugees to improve their awareness on specific issues. The next slide, please. So um, uh, the local staff, uh, as I mentioned, were trained on providing uh, uh, the support and uh, uh, the local staff uh, also were involved in uh, supporting the refugees uh, to uh, uh, participate in uh, uh, intercultural activities because uh, having uh, being together with people and having this access to communication uh, people can learn a lot about the existing services and can sometimes relate their stories to even local population and receive necessary support. That's why uh, it was important that the, uh, the communication is established uh, with different uh, community members. Um, uh, other institutions, uh, of course, that offer GBV support services were institutions as uh, medical services for GBV uh, survivors or older women at risk uh, shelters uh, and uh, advanced technological counseling through different therapies and um, work with perpetrators. As part of this project, we offered uh, psychological counseling of uh, through uh, the professional psychologists and we offered legal counseling and uh, uh, doctors consultations. The next slide, please. So you can see uh, uh, here the photo of psychological counseling. Uh, these were individual counseling uh, sessions and group sessions. And uh, uh, staff that worked uh, with uh, 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 refugees could also provide uh, uh, guidelines on how to refer uh, how to receive and how to uh, communicate about uh, 
uh, uh, GPB services in the communities. So uh, the, the, the psychologists, of course, are professional and they know how to deal uh, with the cases and how to work with the victim, but also staff were trained about uh, do no harm, about the principles of confidentiality. Uh, so uh, there was uh, a complete uh, uh, kind of uh, enabling environment in these sessions, so people were not afraid to come and participate. The next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, there were doctor consultations. Uh, fortunately, we didn't have uh, such cases of, as physical violence, and uh, uh, but we had cases of psychological violence, emotional violence. And so uh, the doctor consultations could uh, 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 focus on uh, some uh, services uh, uh, for uh, GBV cases, uh, but at the same time focusing on cr uh, chronic diseases that all the people experiences, uh, experience as a result of COVID, as a result of old age diseases, for example, joint disorders uh, and uh, and cephalopathy uh, and the clinical treatment, etc. These are, are diseases that uh, are kind of most typical for old age. The next slide, please. These are also uh, law consultations. Uh, the lawyers, in particular, explained how uh, to refer to services for GPV survivors. But at the same time, uh, there are some protection, specific protection issues for all the refugees in Moldova, uh, for those that seek asylum, uh, a more longer term asylum, and the so-called temporary protection asylum, when uh, the victims receive support uh, with uh, uh, their documentation and access to more services available, including services uh, from uh, GPV. The next slide, please. Um, and uh, uh, I was also uh, asked uh, many times about uh, the people's stories and how uh, uh, we could help to uh, all the women uh, uh, that experience violence. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, I included here a couple of uh, um, quotes from all the people, uh, 70, 69 years, uh, uh, that all were saying that... Uh, 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 they were happy uh, being in the uh, communities and receiving uh, support from uh, uh, violence, uh, actually prevention of violence. And you can see that they were saying, we work hard to create a positive environment at refugee accommodation center. Uh, people have different needs. So we amplify their voices, collectively find ways to help each other. Um, there is... Uh, a high level of psychological distress among the refugees, but we are safe, surrounded by incredibly kind and compassionate people. Another uh, refugee was saying, our family has been living with a long-term impact of the war, which began back in 2014 in the first uh, uh, crisis in Crimea. We are uh, support to the volunteers at the safe space who help us connect with our families through the digital technology. Despite these difficult times, we must have moral courage, help each other, and sometimes settle uh, for good uh, 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 and get support from the close ones. Most importantly, we must not lose kindness within ourselves and always uh, find a time to get back to people. And uh, a social worker from Kazushna also uh, highly evaluated the safe space and interaction within the safe space and the protective environment that was created for the refugees. I will stop here and I hope that people will be receiving the slides and uh, will be uh, also uh, uh, getting back if they have more questions. Questions. I just wanted to also thank my colleague Renata Russo for providing the information. She's working for as coordinator in the safe spaces and she made this information available for today's presentation. So thank you, Renata, very much. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you, Tatiana. And thank you, Renata, also for your um, contributions. That was uh, very interesting. And um, I will just uh, restate uh, that we will be record uh, sending the recording to everyone, as well as the PowerPoint slides and the different um, resources that have been managed. And um, that if you have any questions for the speakers, please do put them in the chat. I've seen one or two, as well as some good sharing. So thank you for that. Um, Andrew Kavala uh, from Manepo in Malawi, I'd like to invite you to, uh, to join us now. Andrew, are you able to unmute yourself and join? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. So the floor uh, is yours. Okay. Just let me know when you want me to advance the slide. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate it. I, I just moved out of the office because power has gone off. So I'm sitting in my car somewhere. Uh, so I will, I will keep my video off, but uh, glad you can hear me. Yes, thank you, Andrew. Thanks for uh, going to all these links to join us. So please go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, so, uh, for Malawi, let me introduce myself. I'm Andrew Kavala. I am the country director for Manepo. Manepo is a consortium of civil society organizations working on aging issues in Malawi. And, and thanks to Help Week International for inviting us to be part of this conversation. So uh, I, I'm saying the, the, the worsening climate change, environmental degradation and extreme weather, coupled with the poor planning and adaptation measures are uh, intensifying disasters at an alarming rate in Malawi. Uh, for the past three years uh, or four years, we have had cyclones every year, uh, sometimes two or three cyclones per year, uh, not quite devastating. But in 2019, we had the, the, the most devastating cyclone. Uh, in 2020 and 2021, we had some focus of cyclones, but the worst one was this year, where we, we are saying it's the worst of its kind in the history of Malawi, where a number of lives uh, were claimed during the cyclone. So uh, I went on to say exposure to harm is not uniform and is never uniform. Uh, so despite their capabilities, older women being left out and left behind are caught up in a vicious circle of impact and neglect. Uh, different studies have continuously shown that uh, older men and older women get more vulnerable to disasters, to emergencies. But however, uh, when support is being packaged, it does not target them in the manner that we would expect, and more so when the support does not take into consideration issues of gender. So the impacts of such disasters are highly gendered, with older women carrying the blunt of the impacts. Uh, there are a number of reasons why older women uh, are carrying the blunt of impacts. Studies in Malawi have shown that the most older women have become parents again. Uh, because the HIV and the AIDS pandemic has wiped away uh, a generation, making older women parents again. Now they have this burden of care. And whenever there is a disaster, uh, their motherhood element does not seem to be taken seriously by most of the uh, humanitarian actors. Next slide, please. So I, I went on to say, uh, why are older women more vulnerable than men? So I, I gave a number of reasons. I'm saying unequal and restricted access to economic and social resources. Uh, older women continue to be largely excluded from disaster risk reduction and resilient processes. Uh, older women have lower levels of resilience and the capacity to withstand disasters and recover than, it, than how men would do the same. Next, please. Yes, I, I, I went on to cite a few cases of gender-based violence during emergencies in Malawi. Uh, the recent 
uh, cyclone frayed in Malawi, which hit Malawi in, 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 in March. Uh, the, the, the figures of those who were affected and especially the death which were recorded. There were more women uh, who, who died during the cyclone than men, making, making them more vulnerable to such emergencies. There were also some experiences where uh, there was violence uh, all of, during the leaf distribution. Uh, since people were lumped into tents or evacuation sites, uh, men were more, uh, more aggressive to receive the relief aid, so much so that women were captured on video, being pushed away from the line, some falling down, and even more ways for older women. So we, we noted that that, uh, that was typical of a gender-based violent element within the humanitarian uh, setting, where access to services was an issue for older women. Uh, coincidentally, when the, the, when, when the floods were happening in Malawi in March, Malawi was already uh, recovering from cholera outbreak, a very serious cholera outbreak. Uh, and there were a number of issues, malnutrition issues, which were recorded in the camps. And when we look at the figures, uh, older women, uh, women and older women inclusive, were more uh, vulnerable to the COVID outbreak as they try to ensure that the, their, their siblings, the grandchildren, have access to some basic necessities. In the process, they became victims, and the figures showed more older women, more women per se, uh, had COVID uh, as compared to men. And there were also some pockets of sexual harassment. Uh, by aid providers, but this was mostly for other women of the other age groups. Next, please. So I've, I've, I, I provided the, uh, some cases uh, for Cyclone Anna, which happened last year. Uh, an older woman was robbed her cash uh, through SIM exchange. So I have even given the name Elena Chapenga, a 76 years older woman during the cyclone Anna cash transfer response in, in Mulangi. This Andrew, are you there? Hmm. I still have you listed as a participant. Marion, if Andrew can't join, would you like to take over? Yeah, I think if we move on, Sorry, I uh, put my video on. We can move on to the next slide um, just to give an outline of what Manepo did in that case. So they brought in their complaints response mechanism volunteer. They learned from the Civil Protection Committee for the area that took the liberty to involve the victim support unit. And in this particular case, the man was charged with theft and asked to pay back the money and imprisoned for three months. So the next slide, Sarah. So here, I'm not going to go into too much details here, colleagues, because I believe the presentation will be shared. And uh, we do have another speaker, and I think it's really important if we could move on to our speaker, because some great tools have been developed by IRC on case management and GBV. So if it's okay, Sarah, we could we are planning to share the presentation uh, with participants and that they could catch up on the rest from Manepo. Okay, well, we do have plenty of time left in the webinar. We have another 40 minutes, so- Oh, do um, we? Oh, yeah, I so you'd like to do the full presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, yes great. Back. Welcome back, Andrew. Can you hear me? Sorry, my yes. internet went off. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We were just at case two 
if you'd like to present okay. that. Can I take it up again? Please do. Okay. So uh, this, for this one, the, the, the most recent one, uh, for Cyclone Fred, a husband, uh, nine, 69 sales aid. So what happened is the, uh, one of the beneficiaries, uh, beneficiaries reported through our grievance address officers uh, that her husband took all the items that they received as a couple and she went ahead to sell that and the, what she made out of that she went drinking. So we, we recorded that as a very serious gender-based violence. And this woman is taking care of nine orphans, but the husband was so ruthless to take the relief aid and, 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 and sold. So when the husband was, was, was reproached by the civil protection committee members of the area, uh, the man got so violent and asked the older woman to leave the compound. So it's like, the, the husband was not forthcoming uh, to, to atone for what he did. We, the, the, the victim was, was, was starved for about two days uh, and the husband threatened to, to beat her up. However, through the existing structures, the CPC, uh, the Complex Redress Mechanism Committee and the Community Police Unit, uh, the husband was moved in and, and, and was, was, was given a kind of uh, a punishment for what he did. So this was uh, one of the key gender-based violence cases which we recorded during the most recent cyclone fray. So finally, uh, I, I, we, we thought he, from Manepo side, we could also provide what needs to be done at policy level. Uh, so we, we, we are saying uh, older women should be engaged at all levels uh, to better resilience outcomes at the community level. Uh, we need to strengthen the gender inclusive risk reduction policies and the mechanisms in the face of disasters. And at the same time, uh, there are some women, uh, oh, women who are 60 years and above in Malawi. They are members of parliament. They are lawmakers. And we are saying having more lawmakers in, in, in our parliament, it is going to be easier to enact uh, inclusive policies which would benefit uh, or help to curb the gender-based violence in Malawi. Next slide, please. So we also said what women can do if they are empowered. So I was, we were thinking from theory to practice. So we said uh, women in the first place, they leave their families and the communities after drought. So I, I was saying uh, women are quite very key, though their role is not equally recognized, but they are, they are, the, they are the ones who are key when it comes to uh, ensuring that the stability comes back at a home. They run up and down. And the, this is quite even more uh, crucial for other persons who have a lot of responsibility to handle. At the same time, they have to go through the, the stresses which come with any type of uh, disasters. Uh, women set up, particularly so when they have access to finance, knowledge, and the political agency. When women are given the opportunity uh, to manage uh, a number of things, they are quite very key to see to it that uh, there is stability in their households. And even in the face of resilience, women are very key. The challenge is, uh, the tendency in Malawi is that uh, women are not uh, taken quite very seriously when it comes to uh, decision making, even at the community level. So you see that the most of the committees which are disaster related at the community level, at the regional level, at the, at the district level, they are more men than women. So what we are saying is it has been clear, it has been proven that when women are given such, such, such spaces, they are able to, 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 to bring forth issues which would address uh, gender-based violence because they have uh, the space to participate in decision making and all that. So this is what I thought uh, we can share from, from Malawi. 
uh, the slides will be shared as Marion has put it, but I'm here to take any questions which might come. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, and we do have some questions in the chat, so we'll hold those to the end. And I'd like to invite Danielle to um, come and tell us about the case management process, because I know a lot of people are quite anxious to hear. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you so much to you and Beth for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here with you all, the colleagues from GBDOR, HelpAge International, HelpAge Moldova, Manapo, um, the IRC, we are not specialists at supporting older people. I want to say that up front, but we want to be better at our inclusion work. We want to be better at serving older people and older women specifically within that. So with support from USA, we developed a resource package. It's called Safe at Home, and I'll give you the link to it shortly. Uh, and what we were really trying to do was to look at family violence, but from the lens of gender, age, and disability. And within that framework, we developed a guidance document that's really intended to help caseworkers and their supervisors apply an older age lens to their existing case management practice. Um, so I think most of us know, but as GBV practitioners in humanitarian contexts, case management and psychosocial support really is the bedrock. It's the foundation of our support to survivors and to their GBV programming overall. So we really wanted to focus on this as a first step as we look at how to be better at older age inclusion. So today what I'll do is I'll give you an overview of the guidance that we developed and talk through some of the key considerations that came out within its development. You can go to the next slide, please. So this is just a snapshot of what the guidance actually looks like. You can find it on gbvresponders.org. If you go to under prevention to safe at home in module three, you'll find it there. It's a big resource package, but it's there. Um, the goal really of creating this guidance was to support caseworkers to engage critically with the unique risks that are faced in older age to violence, abuse, and neglect the unique service package that might be required and some sensitive issues that will likely come up, such as the involvement of caregivers and capacity to consent. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to flag what's actually in here. There are, we really try to work um, cross stream in terms of protection. So there are specific pullout sections in this guidance that are for GBV case managers. So for folks that are on this call, but also for protection and rule of law, case management, which is relatively new in general, and some guidance for child protection, uh, case workers more related to referrals and those sorts of linkages. But what the guidance really tries to do is to lay out some building blocks to include some key concepts, forms, and manifestations of violence, abuse, and neglect of older people and offer some helpful tools that can be used across a variety of contexts. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so here's, I think, where we'll get into more of the content for today. I wanted to talk through some of the specific issues that came up as we were looking at older women in GBV case management, some of the learning we heard from partners. Um, so for the first piece here is that one of the things that echoed both in the literature and some of the interviews we did and conversations we had is that the violence that older women might experience is often viewed through a medical model, right? So the care provider field for older women might see the violence that an older woman experiences is based on potentially her frailty or capacity or diminishing capacity to complete daily living activities. And to really link that perception of frailty or perception of lack of capacity to complete daily and living activities to care Caregiver stress. So a caregiver for an older woman might be using violence because they're stressed rather than to base it in the, how we understand as GP practitioners, the cause of violence against all women is being based in gender and power. So there's this risk of not using the gender and power lens in the way that we should as, as GBV practitioners, but also a risk of infantilizing older women and not seeing GBV uh, as, a, as a violation of rights, um, which it is. I think some of the other presentations did a really excellent job talking about barriers to accessing services. I don't want to repeat too much, but just to share a little bit about what we have in the guidance. There are a lot of barriers at different levels. So, right, so if we just talk about access barriers to, to, to getting to case management or medical or legal services, older women might not be able to travel long distances alone or on foot to access services. 
the service setting itself may present significant barriers, right? So it might have stairs, there might be loose cords, it might have an uncomfortable climate, not an appropriate setting. And then there might be attitudinal barriers, which was highlighted earlier as well from service providers, the perception that older women might not need services, that they don't need post-rape prophylaxis, for example, or they don't believe that women can experience violence in older age. They're too old to be sexually assaulted or too old to be living in a dynamic of IPD, which we know is just not true. Um, some of the other issues that came out is that we heard that older women sometimes don't see themselves in the service provision offer in humanitarian settings. Um, they might see that younger women are accessing services and safe spaces with their children more often than older women. Uh, we might have cases where, for example, if a shelter is established, you might see more younger women of reproductive age than older women or even information communication materials that go out. They might not have images of older women. They might not be in the languages that older women speak or in a, a communication format that is accessible. Um, and this was also highlighted earlier, but also shifting experiences of IPV or onset of abuse is also common in uh, older women populations. Um, older women might be acting as caregivers for a partner who has a long history of abuse towards them. And so it's creating a state of isolation, anxiety for themselves while they themselves are aging, right? So it's this life history that was already mentioned, but also poly victimization, very much prevalent in older populations. Um, or alternatively, there can be some situations where an older woman might be experiencing onset of abuse for the first time as a partner is having cognitive decline and really experiencing some shame and stigma related to that and not wanting to seek services as a result. You can go to the next slide. So I just wanted to present some of the issues to consider um, in the case management process. So I think um, a lot of us are probably very familiar with the interagency case management guidelines, um, which is really what we're referencing here um, as, I, as I walk through the steps here. But there's a lot more depth in the document that I showed you. But I, what I really just wanted to do in this presentation was highlight a couple of key points that case managers should be thinking about in the different steps of the case management process. So in step one, really are around the introduction and engagement, um, case managers should be reflecting on how they're seeking consent, capacity consent, and evolving. What do I mean by that? Um, depending on the age of the older woman, her cognitive capacity could be evolving, right? Um, and with that, her capacity consent for a case management process. We always say that we should do everything we can to get the consent of the survivor directly. That is very important. That means using a variety of communication strategies, involving a support, non-perpetrating support person if that is a request of the older person, considering informed assent instead of consent for a case management process, but also being mindful that abusers, especially if they're caregivers for older women, can use this perceptions around capacity to consent as a way to enact a continued dynamic of power and control, right, over the survivor. So the caseworkers really need to be looking at that. Additionally, it's important for caseworkers to think about how can capacity consent change over time with potential changes um, in, in the cognitive state of the older woman um, as it relates potentially to medical problems as well or to pain. Um, and we should never assume because consent cannot be given at that initial engagement point that it cannot be given later. So it, we should definitely always consider it as evolving. As we look to step two of the case management process, we wanted to also highlight you know, the intersecting needs, potential limited social networks and increasing isolation, which was also highlighted by colleagues um, earlier. But what we mean when we say intersecting needs is that an older survivor may have specific needs based on age and gender. Um, and we really should, caseworkers need to be looking and asking the, the survivor about other interactions they've already had with other service providers that they've seen or need to see and some of the barriers that might exist to accessing services that are on offer. 
Um, caseworkers should also look at the social network of an older woman. Is she in a caregiving role? How does that affect her ability to access services? Or is she an older woman who has had an onset of a disability and is increasingly experiencing isolation, is potentially seen as a burden by her family, um, feels some shame and stigma around that. These are all things that need to be taken into account by the caseworker and the case management process. As we go to steps four and five, looking at the case action plan, Caseworkers should be thinking about the wraparound needs and assistance uh, for the older survivor as well as the implication of caregivers. So first, an older survivor might need more time to, to complete the case uh, management the action planning. Um, the caseworker should take into account mobility restrictions, should consider whether a caregiver should be involved, or potentially there may be a non-perpetrating caregiver or a perpetrating caregiver that needs services themselves. And what does that look like? In which case you might actually have two caseworkers involved and need to have case conferencing and so on. So it's potentially a more, more complex cases. And there might be more needs for an older survivor, right? She might um, also need access to assistive devices, different ways to access information. She might need additional transportation, additional hygiene and dignity items. So all of these should be taken into account in the case management process. And finally, as we're going to kind of the case closure and the evaluation of the case, it's just important to keep in mind that new needs may come up for an older survivor throughout the case management process. And it might need to be reassessed even as we get to the end, especially as her health status might change, her capacity to consent might evolve. So really just making sure to take that into account um, throughout. Go to the next slide. Great. So the survivor-centered approach with older survivors. So in that guidance document that I shared with you all at the beginning, um, we do actually have an annex where we talk, what does it look like specifically to provide, to, to enact the survivor-centered approach with older survivors? What do we really need to be thinking about concretely? I think we're all familiar with the different points I have here around confidentiality, respect, and so on. Um, but we really wanted to lay out what that looked like in more detail. So since we have I'm going to permit myself to take just one more minute, if that's okay, Sarah, since we're a little bit ahead of time. Um, okay. Just to, okay, great. Just to give an example on, on respect. So I just took respect as, I think, an important one. How can a caseworker demonstrate respect for an older survivor specifically in the case process, right? So examples of that might include how we greet the client appropriately, what type of verbal language of respect and body language we show to an older person according to the cultural context, what type of uh, manners, how we're polite and curious, um, and courteous, excuse me, we provide a comfortable space for the older survivor to sit. Um, and then if engaging with a caregiver, how do we arrange the seat in a way to convey the status of the client, right, within her family? Um, and that we ensure we continue to honor the survivor's beliefs, ideas, and values, even if she may be experiencing cognitive decline or impairments to thinking and memory that are associated with aging. We do not want to inadvertently infantilize the older survivor or assume that we know better as case managers, right? And remembering that above treatment, that treatment of respect and makes the survivor feel empowered. And that in some cases, conveying respect can be very powerful for an older survivor's own healing process. So I think we can go to the next slide. I think it's just a thank you. Um, so I'm going to close out there. There is a lot more content uh, in the guidance document um, for folks to look through and hopefully think about and reflect on in their own case management process, as well as some tools to understand the older person's and older women's situation analysis, some questions to go in GBV emergency assessment, and so on. So I'll close with that. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present. Thank you, Danielle. I really appreciate it. And, and since we are a little bit ahead of time, um, I wanted to invite Lee Ashley, if she's still available, to um, say a few words about um, access to justice. I had cut them out of her presentation earlier, but since we're a little um, okay for time, Lee Ashley. Sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, maybe I'd just like to close us off with uh, giving a concrete example that I find quite hopeful. Um, I mentioned in my work earlier that I uh, primarily do research 
on conflict related sexual violence and um, over the years, I've worked with a group of survivors from World War II of conflict-related sexual violence. Um, particularly, there were over 200,000 women in World War II who were trafficked um, and were used as sexual slaves. Um, and they continued to fight for justice and, in fact, were quite successful um, in creating a symbolic tribunal um, in the 2000s, which uh, brought a number of uh, perpetrators um, to a symbolic trial, a war crimes trial. Um, and uh, these survivors were in their 80s and 90s. Um, in a moment, I'll try to share my screen and, and share a few photos. Um, but this group of women have really inspired me and really shown that it is never too late uh, for justice. And I, and I want to raise this because it is the quality of service provision that we give during an emergency that really um, sets the stage for what happens after an emergency, which could take decades, but that's okay. And those older survivors are there. We empower people at any age um, to be able to seek justice. And, and just because someone's in their 80s or 90s doesn't mean um, that they can't seek justice. Um, so let me just share the screen. I'll share a photo and also a follow-up um, of something that happened. Um, so it's not just about World War II survivors, but in fact, um, other survivors. Ah, okay, it doesn't look like I can share. So the... The follow-up story to this is this group of women uh, held a war crimes trial uh, tribunal in their 80s and 90s and testified. Lee, um, it yeah, actually, we changed the setting. You can share your uh, pictures now. Great, thanks. So um, they uh, received a lot of international attention um, for what they did. Let me just get the view okay for you. Okay, so you'll see there on the left hand side, uh, these are all uh, survivors. And um, the way that they pursued this justice is through a network. So China, Philippines, um, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Japan. It was a group of Pan-Asia women's groups who created um, this network of survivors and they held this international war crimes tribunal, um, which received a lot of attention. But that was maybe uh, more than a decade ago. But then just in 2021, during COVID-19, I came across another women's group in Malaysia, and they had actually studied the work of, this old, of these older survivors. Um, and they created a similar tribunal, not related to war crimes, but taking that model um, to hear other cases of gender-based violence that had not uh, moved through the court system adequately. And they use it to take cases, they uh, hear trials, write uh, symbolic judgments, and then bring them to government. And then the government um, responds to the cases. So I just wanted to share this um, because I think we really need to invest in older survivors and the capacity and the learning that they really have for all of us um, to do better in the field of gender-based violence response overall, but uh, particularly in the realm of justice, it, it really has no limits uh, what we can learn from older survivors. So I'll end there. Thanks for that time, Sarah. Thank you, Lee Ashley. Very inspiring. I think uh, several of us in the chat were feeling inspired as well. Um, we did have a few questions. We have a few minutes left for questions. Um, so I will open it up to um, all of the panelists. Um, we had an interesting question asking, um, how are you guys seeing any, have you seen any normative changes to looking at old women in your different contexts? Because we know it's been uh, invisible for a long time, but are you seeing a shift? Oh, hi, Sarah. Um, may I respond to that? Yes, uh, from the, Okay, thank you. From the humanitarian 
perspective, certainly in our work, the challenge about older people recognizing, knowing, and collecting good information in an engagement and a participatory way with older people, older women, older people with disabilities, most at risk, is still a challenge. We're still talking about starting even at the basics, which is sex, age, disability, disaggregated data. We're still talking about engaging, talking, asking, and empowering, including older people in those discussions. So we're still uh, talking about that. And we're still challenging the idea that all older people are the same, that they all one and the same thing. So change is coming and change has come in different in different ways, but we're it's still something that we need to continue highlighting. That's just from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Marian. And I would uh, I would also emphasize what you're saying that I often see when they're talking about older persons, they lump them in with the disabled as well, assuming that any older person is disabled, which we know is not the case. There's many very active uh, uh, elder people, including the president of the United States, <laughs> Joe Biden is holding strong at 81. But um, how about uh, Andrew or Tatiana, Lee Ashley or Danielle? Um, what are you seeing? Are you seeing a shift in the norms about speaking about older women? I would probably uh... Uh, add to what Marion has been saying, that uh, indeed uh, overall uh, data on uh, older women uh, depends actually on the uh, country, uh, on the context. For example, in Moldova, uh, there might be, uh, actually there are some changes in relation to um, visibility of issues of older women, but this is due to uh, active government uh, uh, kind of program on active and healthy aging uh, and the overall uh, recognition of the aging issue in the country. But uh, I would agree, as I said with Marian, that it is a very slow process and changing a policy or normative act uh, requires a lot of advocacy. Uh, um, and uh, we as an uh, organization working with policy uh, policy analysis and advocacy have seen uh, some success in the recent years in terms of uh, uh, inclusion of all the people uh, in uh, uh, development settings, in development work, uh, inclusion of all the people in health services, uh, but also uh, inclusion of all the people uh, even in activities on uh, uh, Social services, actually on social services. For example, uh, in Moldova, they have developed social services, a package of so, so, social, minimum package of social, social services. Uh, this uh, has existed, but uh, uh, the package has never included a service, at least for all the people. And uh, thanks to our, our efforts as Halpage International, uh, this year, they included two services in the minimum package, the service on home care and the service on uh, uh, social canteens. Before, this was not included. So there is hope, but the process is long and, and actually um, lots of efforts are required to achieve a result. But I would encourage to continue. Thank you for that, Tatiana. Andrew, Danielle, do, would you like to add anything? I can maybe just add one thing. I don't know how positive it is, but just in the sake of this is a community of practice and just being honest, um, when we were developing this guidance, we went back and to look at IRC's global GBV IMS data, right? And so IRC works in about 40 countries globally in humanitarian crises to see how many older women were we actually serving, right? And we were looking at the age group, age 50 and above. Looking at the global data, less than 2% of the survivors we were serving were older women. 
So I think this was in 2021 that we looked at this data. So it's been a few years, but I don't think a lot has changed. I want to be honest. So that was one of our you know, reflections and reasons we wanted to develop the guidance that I shared with you all today to start with the essentials and response. But I think we have a long way to go. I think it's hard because there's different identity groups, right? And when we think about inclusion, <laughs> And so sometimes we just lump older women within that um, and we don't really focus um, in the way that we should, right? So you know, it's just a reflection for me. I think there's a lot more we can do as um, GP responders. Thanks for that, Danielle. I agree with you. Um, I feel like we are just starting to get our head around um, adolescents and the need to focus on them. And now we're forgetting the top end of the range. Um, myself, um, as we started to put this together, I was like, what is the age for older women? So it's, uh, you know, we're just knowing that kind of information and hopefully webinars like this will help others. There was a question here um, about what do you all think are the best methods to document the unique challenges? I, I, I Andrew, maybe, please, please go ahead. Yeah, sure. I, I wanted to concur with the, what Marion and Tiana have said. I think he, Generally, the major issue, as I mentioned in my presentation, is that the, uh, engaging uh, policymakers to ensure that the, there is an element of inclusion and the, some strategies on how to address gender-based violence uh, has always been a nightmare. But the good news for Malawi is, uh, after the recent cyclone fraid, uh, government moved in to table the, order, the, the, the humanitarian the disaster risk management bill, uh, which has been uh, hanging for over 15 years, and it was approved, and the president moved in to uh, sign the bill into a law. So as I speak to you now, Malawi has got a disaster risk management act in place, which has specific provisions on how to address gender-based violence. So I'm hoping that the, the landscape is going to improve because now we have a law in place on how such cases can be handled. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for that inspiring note. Um, so I'll ask you all, um, what do you think are the best methods for documenting these changes? Um, Lee Ashley presented the whole of Syria um, document that they'd put together and they have the very inspiring voices, humanitarian uh, needs overview, voices qualitative section. We've heard you all talk about sexual, uh, sex age, disability disaggregated data, but do you have any tips on really trying to collect uh, information about um, older women? Well, if I could just jump in. Um, yes, I mean, as expertise in this area, I know that our participants know that it is very, very sensitive, a very, very sensitive issue to get into. Within HelpAge's experience, uh, in responding to different humanitarian crises, when in the past we did it directly uh, with country offices, and we continue to do with some country offices like in Ukraine, but overall we are now very much partner-led uh, programming approach. So it's partners and network members that do it. Um, we, in trying to understand older people and the different diversities and lives they have and experiences, we do have a needs assessment that we conduct. And within that, we do ask questions on their perception of what are the protection risks that older men, older women face. And within that, there is the opportunity for them to, to mention, talk about different types of violence, abuse and neglect. Um, but we have to be very careful, as I said at the start, because it's very sensitive. Um, and older people are in a very delicate situation because in many, in many contexts, it's occurring within the family and within the home. Uh, we are not experts on GBV. Uh, we tend to really reach out to service providers who are much better placed to provide support for those who are surviving GBV. We try to work together and share our knowledge and experience on working with and engaging with older people. Uh, I'm not sure if that answers the question, Sarah, but I, I will leave it there for now. 
Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Marian. Um, I'm going to ask Shiva to go ahead and launch our evaluation poll as I wait for any other um, people who might like to speak. We're trying to get better about uh, making sure that we program to meet your needs as gender-based violence activists and specialists. So um, please feel free to give us a little bit of feedback um, on this webinar. And then um, I will ask Lee Ashley, Danielle, Andrew, Tatiana, any last words or anything you would like to share before we close? up um if i may i would like to share some uh, uh practice from our own work on uh, documenting evidence as uh, marion said it's really important to keep confidentiality when sharing any data uh, about gpp work that's why um we uh, kind of have this experience of uh, uh, positive champions or positive deviants. Uh, and this is an experience that was gained as part of our participation in UN Trust Fund project that we are running already the second project. Uh, and basically this is uh, identifying uh, women uh, that confronted violence and uh, that are not afraid uh, to speak in public and uh, present uh, they are story, uh, and this story can be uh, teaching uh, uh, other older women uh, to follow uh, in the same uh, kind of uh, path uh, uh, as the positive uh, deviants or let's say positive champions. So that might be one of the possibilities, because of course we have papers, we have social media, whatever, but when uh, uh, there is, let's say, a personal story and a person behind this story that can present it, it is more powerful. So I, I think this, uh, in our context, that worked quite well, but we always need to be careful about confidentiality and do no harm. But positive champions is quite a, 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 an advanced method. Thank, Thank you. you for that, Tatiana. And I agree. Also, the more that we see older women represented in our um, visuals, like I really uh, appreciated seeing the pictures on the PowerPoints today. And I know Help Age Moldova has a lovely uh, video about the resilience and the strength of older Ukrainian refugees that we showed yeah. in another webinar. Lee yeah. Ashley, Danielle, Andrew, would you like to add anything before we close? I'll just build on what Tatiana said on the group of survivors that I've worked with who are older. Um, some of them also worked as champions, but got very involved in working on educational curriculum and also being speakers. Um, and really, they were paired with youth because uh, one of their missions was to make sure that younger generations really understood the impact of gender based violence. Um, so I think that that's a real model to build on. So working across generations um, between older persons and youth, and that's a very powerful dynamic, including that Tatiana shared from, from their experience. And I would just say it's never too late uh, to work with a survivor. Over. Thank you, Lee Ashley. Anyone else? Yeah, so I think I think from, from my side, I would say thank you so much to all the presenters. I think uh, it's been a learning session for us and we'll be looking forward to strengthen our systems when it comes to ensuring that the, we are able to address gender-based violence targeted that all the women during uh, in a humanitarian setting. So thanks for, the, for arranging this and thanks for all the comments we highly appreciate. Thank you, Andrew. And Danielle, I'll leave the last word to you if you'd like to say a few things. Oh no, the last word. <laughs> better be for them. No, just to say, I think we can do better as humanitarian actors with a little bit of intentionality, right? Um, so I really hope that, you know, we've all been able to learn. I know I've learned from Help Age and other colleagues on this call and just to start to reflect on how we can better support older women because there's definitely a need and a lot to learn as others have said. Thanks so much. Thank you. And I'd like to thank all of you for your presentations today, all of you that joined us today and your questions and comments in the chat. Special thank you to Shiva from the GBV AOR supporting us with the technical support and to my colleague, Beth Fan, who is an inspiration to me as well, but couldn't be here because she's based in California. And although we're stretched from Mexico to Australia with our presentations today, 
we couldn't quite go a little bit further. So um, thanks for joining us. If you'd like to join the GBV AOR Community of Practice, um, or if you have uh, suggestions for webinars or topics that you'd like for us to present on, please write us at gbvcop at gmail.com. And thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, colleagues.